In the previous video, I outlined how to obtain the solution of Laplace equation in a circular disk. It's the Dirichlet problem. And we obtained the first of our two Poisson integral formulas. In this video, we're going to obtain the second of those two Poisson integral formulas and do an example. So in this case, we're going to be considering the upper half plane. So we want the solution of Laplace equation in the upper half plane. As was the case with our circular disk, there are several different ways that we can obtain the Poisson integral formula for this case. I'll, I'll do it using conformal mapping. And once again, I'm just going to sketch the overall procedure. You can look at the details if you're interested in the text. So the way we're going to do this is to take the solution we just obtained for the circular disk of radius r and conformally map that into the upper half plane. And in doing so, conformally map the Poisson integral formula for that case. So to start, I'm going to rewrite the Poisson integral formula that we obtained for the circular disk in a slightly more compact fashion. You'll notice I've written the sines and cosines as exponentials here. And then we apply it to a unit disk. So a unit disk has radius of 1. So this gives us a somewhat simplified form of the Poisson integral formula for the solution in the disk. Now we can then map the interior of the circle now a unit circle, radius 1, into the upper half plane, which is just everything where v is positive, using a conformal mapping f of z. I'll show you what that is in a moment. So again, r, theta, z are points inside the domain. And then points on the boundary are given by, this should be sigma here, sigma and capital R, which is now 1. So we're actually going to use a fractional transformation. And the reason for that is we're going to map a circle into a line. Uh, again, a line is a circle of infinite radius. So it's going to go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So to do that, we select three points. Z1 is minus 1. Z2 will be minus i. And Z3 will be 1. So three points on our circle. And we're going to map those. W1 is going to be mapped to the origin. So that's going to correspond to this image point. W2 will be at 1. So that corresponds to this image point. And then W3 is going to be at infinity. And as always, infinity is everywhere at infinity. Positive, negative, everywhere. And that's going to be this point. So essentially what we're doing is we're opening up the circle at Z3, throwing that to infinity. So it gets spread all the way throughout infinity. And then uh, this, again, will be the origin. And this will be a point at, at 1. As always with these mappings, this is not unique. This is not the only mapping that will accomplish the goal of mapping the interior of the unit circle into the upper half plane. However, this is the one that I've chosen to use. So let's get the inverse fractional transformation. Remember that implicit relationship is equation 2.1. Substituted in the z123, the w123, you get z is a function of w, and w is a function of z. The inverse fractional transformation is this one. z is capital F of w. It's w minus i over w plus i. So that's a fractional transformation uh, that accomplishes this mapping. Now, one thing that's always good uh, to do, and I, I mentioned this at the very end of, of the video, but just to mention it here as well, is be sure that the interior of the domain does map to where you expect it to. So in this case, all I can ensure with this fractional transformation is that points on the boundary get mapped to points on the boundary. So the interior, for example, if I were to take a point at 0, at the origin, where would that map to in the w plane? And just confirm that indeed it does map to the upper half plane, because it's equally possible that it could map to the lower half plane. So just to be sure, take a point and double check that it does, in this case, go to the upper half plane. Now you can see I've grayed out a lot of this material, because again, I don't want to go through the details. The details are there. If you'd like, it gets pretty messy. You'll see phrases like lots of algebra, a bunch more algebra, so this does get quite messy, but in fact, you can show that this mapping does what we would like. And it also results then in a new version of the Poisson integral formula. So again, it's taking the Poisson integral formula that we obtained in the last video for the circular disk and now transforming it, mapping it conformally to the upper half plane. 
and in doing so we get an expression for v hat here of uv in terms of this integral. So we're integrating here with respect to xc, which goes along the entire real axis from minus infinity to infinity. The phi xc zero, that's v is equal to zero, that corresponds to the value of phi on the boundary, so that's the boundary condition. And then we have this integral, similar to before, but it's in a somewhat simpler form uh, for the upper half plane. Now you'll notice, because of the way we did this uh, using a conformal mapping, this is written in the w plane. We can simply convert it to the z plane by switching the u's to x's, v's to y's, and phi hats to phi. So just keep that in mind. You can write in the z plane, the w plane, whichever is most convenient. Now, as mentioned before, there are other ways to obtain the Poisson integral formula for the upper half plane. You can use the Fourier transforms. You can use Green's functions. Okay, so let's do a, an example to illustrate how to use the Poisson integral formula to solve Laplace's equation in a, a more complex domain. So I'm going to couch this in terms of electrostatic potential. Again, as I've mentioned before, we could consider this to be steady heat conduction. We could view this as a potential flow problem. So the physical context really doesn't matter, but we'll couch it in terms of electrostatics for this particular case. So the dependent variable is E, it's a function of x and y, and we want to determine the solution of the electrostatic potential in a semi-infinite strip. So it goes all the way to positive infinity and bounded below by the real axis. The boundary conditions will have as constant along the left boundary all the way up to infinity, constant from minus one to one, the lower boundary, and then another constant all the way on the right side to plus infinity. So three constant boundary conditions, so it's a Dirichlet problem, and we would like to get the solution in this semi-infinite strip. So, uh, first of all, of course, you look and you think about, can I solve Laplace's equation in that semi-infinite strip using techniques that we already have available to us? And the answer is no. It, even though it's relatively simple geometry and it seems similar to the infinite strip that we had in a previous example in an earlier video, in fact, this is, truly is now a two-dimensional problem. Uh, there's no, no straightforward way to solve this. So, we need to solve Laplace's equation in our semi-infinite strip. But we need to do so through a conformal mapping. So we want to take the semi-infinite strip in the z-plane, map it to the w-plane into a simpler geometry. In this case, it'll be either the upper half plane or interior of a circle, so we can use the Poisson integral formula, solve it, and then map the solution back. Same procedure as usual. So the mapping that's going to do that for us is w is f of v is sine of pi over 2z. So I'm not going to show the details here in this video, but I would encourage you to take a look at sine pi over 2z and determine that indeed it does map that semi-infinite strip into the upper half plane. Essentially what it does is it takes that semi-infinite strip, so we have the two vertical sides all the way to infinity, and then we have the real axis. And what that does is it lays down the two sides so the boundary of the domain is now the real axis and we have the upper half plane as the interior of the domain. So again, you can walk through those details if you'd like and confirm that that is in, indeed the case. And that would be good practice to do that. So having said all that and you then filling in the blanks and the details of that mapping, what you'll find is that the point at minus one stays at minus one. The point at one also stays at one. And again, all that's done is laid down the left and right boundaries. So you'll notice I, I put a z1, z2, z3, z4, z5, 2 and 4 show the corners, 1, 3, and 5 are on each of the three boundaries, and so you can see 2 and 4, the corners stay at minus 1 and 1, uh, w3, corresponding image point for the origin stays at the origin. So this portion of the boundary doesn't move. And then this portion with W1 and this portion with W5 then again are just laying down. And that then encompasses the entire upper half plane. So now we want to solve Laplace's equation, written again here now for E hat to signal that we're in the W plane. And in terms of U and V now are the independent variables u real axis, v imaginary axis as always. 
I've rewritten the boundary conditions, same, E0 from minus infinity to minus one, E1 from minus one to one, and then E2 from plus one to positive infinity. So we now have the upper half plane, we wanna solve Laplace's equation, so we pull out the appropriate Poisson integral formula for the upper half plane, here it is. Now what was the phi is the capital E hat, it is now written again in terms of u and v. Again, you can write it in either plane. We're solving it in this case in the w plane. So I write it in terms of u and v everywhere. And then we have the boundary condition, which is the value of the dependent variable, in this case, the electrostatic potential, along the boundary, so along the real axis. So going from minus infinity to infinity, again, we're gonna have three segments from minus infinity to minus one, from minus one to one, and from one to plus infinity. So we'll divide up the integral into those three segments, each one having a constant value of the boundary, but a different constant value. Now you'll notice if this is a constant, I can take it outside the integral, and I then just have the integral of one over C minus U quantity squared plus V squared. And that is an integral for which we know the solution, or at least we can get it out of an integral table somewhere from Wolfram Alpha or whatever. So. Here is the ex general expression for that integral from A to B, from A to B. So you see it's this arctan. Okay, so we write it out, E hat. There's E zero times this portion, which goes from minus infinity to minus one. E one times this portion from minus one to one, plus E two times this portion from one to infinity. Okay, then we put in the limits of integration. And remember, we're integrating with respect to xc. So minus one goes in for xc, minus infinity. So the first integral is here on this line, minus one, minus infinity. The second integral is on this line, minus one to one. And the third integral is on this line, from one to plus infinity. Now you have to remember some of the properties of arctans. So, which I've included down here. So the arctan of minus x is minus arctan of x. Arctan of minus infinity is minus pi over two, and arctan of infinity is pi over two. So you can use those for the infinities here and here. Uh, you can take out a minus sign out of this one, as, as we showed here, and so forth. So you can simplify these based on the properties of the inverse tangent. Then you pull it all together, and this is the final result that you get. All right, so this is the solution in the W plane in terms of U and V. It's not the final solution because we need to transform it back to the Z plane, but this is the solution in terms of U and V, which I've highlighted there in red. Okay, so now we need to do the plug and chug part. So we need to get the U and the V, the real and imaginary parts of the mapping that then will allow us to transform back to the z plane. So here's the original mapping, sine of pi over 2 z, and we'll write z as x plus i y. So we have sine of something plus something. You go look at your trig identities and you remind yourself that sine of something plus something is sine of the first something times cosine of the second something plus cosine of the first something times sine of the second something. Then you remember cosine with an i in it becomes a cosh and the i goes away and a sine with an i in it becomes a cinch uh, and it throws out the i. All right, so this is what we get. This is the real part plus i times the imaginary part. So this is u and this is v. u is sine times cosh and v is cosine times cinch. So then these get substituted back in for u and v, for u and v. So we get a rather complex looking expression in the end, but that's the solution for E as a function of now X and Y rather than U and V. Let's plot some, some different sample solutions. So I'm gonna just pick different values of E0, E1, and E2 and show what we get. So here's E0 is zero. Remember that's the, the left side. E1 is one, that's along the bottom, the real axis. And E2 is zero, that's on the right side. So it's 0, 1, 0. And I'm plotting lines of constant equipotential, electrostatic potential, starting with 0 out here, 
and then 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, down to one along the boundary. You'll notice how the contours pile up in the corners because there's a change from zero to one in the electrostatic potential, so all the corresponding contours then pile up in the corners. Here's zero for the left, one for the bottom, and two for the right. So zero, one, two. So it goes from zero to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 to one, which is the same as the bottom, and then 1.1, 1.2, up to 1.9, and then two. Once again, you see how the contours pile up in the corners, where's the, where there's the dramatic change in the boundary condition from zero here to one, and from one to two. Here's one more, E0 is zero, E1 is two, E2 is one, so zero, two, and one. Again, piling up in the corners where there's dramatic change in the equipotential in the boundary, and then starting here at 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, up to one on that contour, as well as the right boundary, and then 1.1, 1.2, so forth, up to two along the bottom boundary. So all three of those solutions are contained within that general solution using the Poisson integral formula for the solution in the upper half plane, which was mapped back then to the semi-infinite strip.